watching Believe. We are a conscious media company bringing you guys stories revolving around money and business, health and wellness, true success, our universe, and world news. You can always find us at our website, believe.love, youtube.com forward slash believe loves you, as well as Facebook, facebook.com forward slash believe loves you as well. Um, Apple users, you can check us out, um, believeitunes.com, and for Android, believeandroid.com. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. I am Vanessa. We're going to jump into a few topics here um, that are very, very close to me, really close to my mindset within the past two days and everything else. So I'm just going to go ahead and get right into it. Um, starting with health and wellness, this is for individuals. We're going to be talking today about exercise and going to the gym and all these different kinds of things. But really, it's more so for the person that maybe doesn't like going to the gym or maybe doesn't doesn't really see that, I guess, for themselves. Maybe you're busy or whatever else that it is. And I'm going to possibly introduce another form of cardio to you guys, and hopefully it's one that excites you as much as it excites me. So um, let's get into it. You may be one of those individuals who are attempting you know, to adjust your health habits, and really get into shape and change all of those different things. And you may have considered going to the gym or maybe running on the beach, um, all the while still, of course, continuing to work and figure out your other life goals. Like I said, it's um, we are really busy and we're trying to implement all these amazing things to help us get through the day, but we still have other things that we need to do to get through the day. So one thing though about working out and fitness that not too many people mention, I feel like I don't hear this enough, in that it really should be fun. It should be something that you enjoy, something that you look forward to doing, you know? It, it shouldn't just be let's wait and blah, blah, blah. Like, it should be fun. You should be pumped to go and um, and to get fit. But we do get it, that people are busy. There's a lot more going on in your life. Um, and who really has the time, right? We hear things like that all the time. You probably start off great, though. Um, I've heard so many times New Year's resolution, the beginning of the year, these different things. And... You start off great, almost everyone. You you go to the gym or you meet with that trainer and you're, you're very consistent, but then it starts to just fall off after a few months. And it happens to a lot of people. So we're really trying to figure out exactly why and what that is. But we know that there is there's like there's a drive to get it done, right? But it just doesn't continue. And I think it might have to do a lot with that whole fun factor and the fact that you get that working out just isn't fun. Um, I guess generally, maybe you have a trainer that makes it fun and then maybe that's the reason why you're probably still going. Um, but I would like to suggest something. We're going to share with you or I'm going to share with you another option possibly that maybe you just haven't considered and that is dancing. Yes, dancing. I'm personally a former competitive dancer of like 15 plus years, something like that. Um, but now I just teach, I'm fortunate enough to just teach a uh, youth group of very, very, very ambitious girls and actually a few gentlemen as well. And, you know, I've been very grateful, like I said, and privileged to share my love and passion for dance with these girls and, you know, with these young individuals who didn't really get to do it, you know, to the magnitude and to the extreme that I did growing up. But anything that I can do to help is awesome. And so I'm always pushing them to just be better, to just be better, not even just dance wise, but just, you know, in all aspects of life. And I think that when we meet and we get together, um, it's bigger, it's greater than just, you know, getting together to dance. So I want to go over just some of the really, really cool points. You know what I mean? Some things that maybe not everybody really thinks about when it comes to to dance and how we can how we can work this out. So one is that dance is a total body workout. 100%. It is. It combines um, cardiovascular, strength, balance, flexibility. And you'll usually find all of these things within one routine or one exercise or activity. You know, you jump, you kick, you stretch your muscles, you have to turn, which attributes to your balance and your heart and your core, really strengthening your core. And dancing is just all around. It's not just one thing. It's not like, oh, leg day. Although we do have things like that on um, we do have what we would call like conditioning classes where we only focus on conditioning the body rather than working on routines and all that kind of stuff. But even still, when we're focusing on conditioning, we're not just hitting one part of the body. We're hitting almost every single muscle. And it's literally just understanding how all these muscles work in conjunction with each other to kind of make that beautiful flowing dancer that you see. That's the idea of dance. 
So that's number one, that it's a total body workout and you're just gonna be hitting all, everything, you know? You're not gonna miss a single thing. Number two is that you won't plateau. I hear very often that when you're working out, it's very easy to plateau or just like remain consistent. Um, I guess stop progressing, you know? And it's just really, it's just, it happens very often. I hear it all the time. Um, and it doesn't really make sense. Well, it does make sense, I guess, when you're really considering common fitness and you're going in there and you're doing it every day, the same thing every day, the same thing every day. But I'm saying it doesn't make sense why you would want to do that. You would want to mix it up, try new things. But then again, this is maybe somebody that doesn't or isn't familiar with cardio as it is. So maybe you learn from someone else or you're just continuing what it is that you do learn. I'm just saying that with dance, you're constantly moving and it's never the same. You're always learning something different and your body will be challenged every day. You're, you know, growing up, we would um, actually frequently change our cardio routines and even change teachers. We would go through master choreographers and different stuff like that. We were always changing teachers so that we were always learning different styles, different ways to move our bodies, different techniques, and all these different kinds of things. So versatility is a huge factor of dance, just period. You want to be able to do many different things. Um, so you'll never plateau, really. You'll never really hit a mark. You're, you're always going to learn something new. And I'm mentioning dancing in general. Um, I, that's what I'm mentioning here throughout the entire uh, topic here. But I do want to go so far as to say that, you know, if you're just looking to work out and you could possibly implement just dance conditioning exercises. I like to say that dancers, we condition, we use our body against our body instead of like lifting weights and other external factors to kind of build our body, we literally push against ourselves, you know? We build our muscle with, with our muscle, if that makes sense. And I think that it's amazing, and, and I think it really makes you stronger, and it makes you more connected to your body and more connected to the experience. So I would say that if you just wanna look into, maybe you don't really think you can dance per se, but maybe you wanna just look into different cardio techniques, different conditioning techniques, other than just lifting a weight, I would definitely look into dancing cardio and stuff like that as well. Number three is that dance fosters self-expression. That's one of the biggest, one of the biggest things for myself for sure. One of the coolest things about dance, I, I would definitely say, is that it's the only exercise that has an artistic component, you know, which truly allows you to serve as a form of therapy. Dancing is, is more like therapy than it is like just working out, just like going to the gym. You'll approach a movement sequence in a different way based on your mood, based on your thoughts, based on your emotions, based on what happened to you that day. You completely make it your own. And this I'm speaking from my own experience 100%. I mean, we would go in that, you know, every single day was different. We'd be working on one routine, so to speak, you know, for competition or for a recital or something. And it's crazy how on a day where we all just were going through something dramatic, <laughs> bunch of girls, things can happen. But on those days when we're like, when everyone was in like their feels or they're really, really emotional, we're like some of the most brilliant dancing days. We're crying, we're dancing, we're loving it. And it's crazy how much that truly just changed the experience. It truly made it bigger than ourselves. And that's what I love about dance. It's to all about self-expression. It's all about just being in the moment, you know? And research totally proves the healing benefits of self-expression. So that just goes without even saying. But this connection between the way that you move and how you're currently feeling promotes self-awareness and self-esteem and a safe place um, for the expression of those feelings, a safe place for it to resonate. So you're boosting confidence and you're gaining awareness all while working out and shedding pounds. Is that not cool? So that's number three. That's a pretty good one. Number four is um, mental mastery. You'll be able to, to really master your emotions, so to speak. Through dancing, you're maximizing your brain's functions. While you're pushing your body to the next level, your brain is trying to keep up with the sequence and the dance patterns and remembering what it is that you've already learned while adding on the previous steps you had already mastered. Trust me, it is a lot to do. The key is that dancing integrates several brain functions all at one, all at once. Like it's literally all at the same time. Um, Rational, musical, emotional, um, kinesthetic, all of it. It's furthering, increasing your neural connect connectivity. It's just, that's just amazing if we just look at it from that perspective and the fact that your brain is literally using so many pieces at once, working in conjunction with each other just so that you can be able to perform this dance. 
And what that means, just to, to give you another step further, you're utilizing your brain when you're recalling steps, trying to figure out certain moves um, and keeping up with the music, of course, keeping up with the tempo and the beat. So while you're working on your body, you're also working on your mind. That's what's really cool about just dancing in general, of course. And finally, 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 dance is fun. So much fun. It's important to enjoy your fitness time. I truly, truly believe that. This ensures that your fitness goals will last beyond the early months. Remember how we were talking about you start working out and then you just give it up, you completely forget. I think that that's the key. If you enjoy what you're doing, if you love and you look forward to doing it, why would you stop? You'll just keep going, you'll just keep progressing, you'll just keep trying, you know, rather than pushing it off to the side. So dance is more like an experience. It's more than just working out. You know, unlike a simple workout, you have to concentrate, you have to be present in the moment. You know, you're, and that can happen, of course. I've, I've been around really, really, of course, professional and trained dancers where maybe you're not really thinking about what you're doing. But I, I, I see what they're talking about, you know, when it really comes to, when it comes to really being present in the moment. I feel like when you're at the gym, I don't know what it is that you're possible, you know, what you can be thinking about anything, it's possible. And then when you're dancing, you know, it's true, you could be thinking about anything, but you're most likely really, really focusing on that moment. You're most likely feeling the music hearing what, you know, hearing what the music is doing. Because as dancers, we're essentially dancing um, the music. We are the instruments, so to speak. And so you're listening to the music, you're listening to the words, you're listening to the pattern, and you're also trying to recall what it is that you have to do. And so it's really just a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. But this creates something to look forward to, like I said, and instead of something to just check into or check off of your to-do list. So dancing is the unique is unique in the way that you look forward to this time and you know that you will come out of the other end feeling high on life and feeling really, really accomplished. Like you truly did something and not just working out, not just burning sweat just for the sake of doing it, but truly, truly, truly loving the time that you share with your body and getting to know your body and letting your body speak to you. So I would say, if you're not a gym person, maybe dance it off instead. Now we're gonna move over to our next topic here, um, our universe. Let's talk about climate change. Now, the Earth's climate has changed throughout history. Um, just in the last 650,000 years, there have been seven cycles of glacial advance and retreat. With the abrupt end of the last ice age about 7,000 years ago, which is what they believe, which is marking the beginning of our modern uh, civilization or climate era, most of these climate changes are attributed to very small variations in the Earth's orbit that change the amount of solar energy um, our planet actually receives. So, if you don't believe in climate change, can you at least understand how the fuel and the gas from the millions of, you know, the vehicles that we have now inhibiting the earth pollute our earth? You know, how those things maybe aren't good for us and how they could possibly be affecting this thing? Or can we agree that these factories, right, um, since the Industrial Revolution, you know, they blow out these toxic gases and that also can't be good for our, our planet. I truly, truly wonder... Um, just how much or how often people really think about these things, really think about the things that they do or the, uh, the little things that they partake in on a day-to-day -day basis that could possibly be, you know, ruining or damaging our earth. And it's because we grow up, I think it's because we grow up like living this way. <clears throat> I was born in the 90s, so I'm actually fortunate enough to see, you know, dial-up internet and first, well, some of the few first cell phones, at least the first smartphones, you know, and I really, I saw, you know, Twitter, Facebook, all these things. It happened in my lifetime. So, I mean, I'm, it's it's a little weird for someone like myself because I've, I've had an understanding of the way the world was prior to all of this, but I'm still very much, you know, connected and involved with all of this. And I really, really, I'm really thinking about the younger, younger generations who just kind of grew up in the, in this way of lifestyle. But even still, I mean, before technology, we did have the Industrial Revolution, and that, in a sense, was like crazy at that time. And it's like we're growing up, and we're we're being, you know, we're being taught this is the way that the world is. And it's possible that that's the reason why we don't necessarily think that it's really affecting us. We're used to this, you know, new world, and we're used to 
you know, the the improvements of human ra- of the human race and human civilization, and we just look at everything as positive, positive, without truly, truly thinking about the negative benefit or the negative, I should say, disadvantages. Um, but in reality, right, even still us Westerners here on uh, the other side of the globe, we, we're seeing more and more people are adopting ancient Eastern philosophies, you know, eating practices, you know, going back to plant-based diets, um, meditation and yoga, implementing mindfulness into your lifestyle. There are so many things that have been here for thousands of years, but we're now at least, I'm glad, that's what I'm seeing more so now, is that people are finally, finally, I guess, kind of going back in a sense, but still, I feel like it doesn't necessarily end there. And I'm still not entirely sure if us going back and us and us going through all of these things is still, you know what I mean, is still helping. I really shouldn't even say that because I know that it's helping. But what I mean by that is that I'm not sure if that's it, right? I feel like there's so much more that is still happening here. And we're finally starting to understand that the way of life is our way of life, this Western way of life, technology, technology, and, you know, AI and everything else. And it's kind of like cutting off the human connection and like cutting off our, our relationship with nature, if you will. We're seeing that it truly isn't sustainable for our life. We're seeing that things are falling off. We're thing, seeing that things are just getting kind of bad, right? So I would say we must stop destroying our environment polluting and just not taking care of this beautiful, beautiful earth. And I don't think, I don't think that it's right. I don't think that anyone would even disagree with what I'm saying. But let's really, let's, let's really talk about some other things here. The current warming trend is a, a particle significance or particular significant because most of us, most of it is extremely likely. About 95% probability is what they're saying, greater than 95% to be a result of human activity since the mid 20th century and proceeding at a rate that is unprecedented over decades to millennia. So they're saying that it's quite possible climate change, all these different things is a direct result of our human activity since the mid 20th century with uh, the industrial revolution, with technology, with all these different things that we're kind of putting on this earth now, or at least I guess taking advantage of on this earth now. And the problem is that people have made exposing globalist agendas synonymous with denying climate change. And this can't be further from the truth. There are a lot of other issues like this. You know, vaccines, our food, our medicine. We understand that there are there are a few different powers, if, if, if you will. There are a few different powers. We have, we have our government, of course, which, as we know, they, they do control quite a bit. Things like the 1%, we've heard. We've heard stuff like that. And so they like, everybody likes to put them all in one group. They like to put them all in one category. And it's like, we're kind of either always opposed. You have to kind of stand on one side of the line. It seems to, it seems to be, you either agree with them 100% or you don't. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't necessarily think that that's right, but I feel like that's the issue with people not believing climate change. It's because there are scientists, climate scientists that are saying, you know, these, this is an issue, our fossil fuels. It's really, it's really damaging our planet. And we need to do something about it. We need to correct this. And then there are people that just don't want to worry about that. There are people that love the benefits of our modern lifestyle and they don't see the the harm in fossil fuels. So they try to change that narrative and kind of make everybody else seem crazy. When in reality, there are so many realities when it comes to climate change and the fact that climate change in itself has always been here. (laughs) We're studying the earth. If if you, you do agree with NASA and if you do, you know, study these things or look into these things, and of course you're going to realize that Climate change has been here way before we were even here. So our Earth has always been an ever-changing Earth. So the concept of climate change shouldn't be one that is like crazy or misunderstood even or even thrown out the window because it's very much relevant and it's very much true. And the Earth, we have Earth orbiting satellites and other technological advances have enabled scientists to see the big picture, collecting many different types of information about our planet and its climate on, glo- on a global scale. So this body of data collected over many years reveals the signals of a changing climate. And that's from the beginning of our time to now and so on. I'm sure it'll continue. People still don't believe it, though. People just don't um, just don't want to believe it. And the case against science is straightforward. Um, Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Science has taken a turn towards darkness, says Dr. Richard Horton 
Um, and like I was just saying a minute ago, um, we hear about things like this. And I think that this is a very relevant as well when it comes to this conversation because there are a lot of weird things that happen. You know, we have we have a huge group of people, right? That like the UFO, the Phoenix Lights uh, topic I was mentioning recently. We have so many people that claim that they saw that, that, that UFO. We have images, we have video, we have over 20,000 testimonies. And then we have the Air Force base or the, you know, the, en the engineer corps saying that it was flares, you know, saying that it's not whatever, what the 20,000 people thought it was, it wasn't. And so it's so difficult to not get behind those people that are like, anything they say is a lie because they clearly do do weird stuff like that where we are all on the same page. We're all seeing the same thing and they're still going to try and, you know, kind of misconceive or misguide us, if you will. And so we hear things like 90% of climate 90% of climate scientists believe that climate change is real. And people still like to play around like these are just suggestions. These are just things being thrown around or that these things just don't affect them. And I think that's why they don't care to look into it further. Perhaps people don't want to look at the reality of what their modern lifestyle really stands for and what it is really doing. But how honestly can anyone doubt this? I mean, you might be thinking, because I honestly would be thinking this. Why can this even be a debate? How is this even a debate when we have species and like so many, like a plethora of species, not just a few, going extinct like on a regular basis? At an alarming rate, they're going extinct. Our forests are being destroyed. Our world is literally polluted. You know, you can see it just step outside. So how is it that you don't understand that all these little things add up? All these little things can totally result in climate change and can Forget the term climate change. If that's what's bothering you, it can affect us is the, is the point. You know what I mean? It totally is something that we are responsible for. We did all of these things. We're the ones cutting down the trees. We're the ones killing these animals, unfortunately. You know, we're the ones polluting the, the, um, the air with our cars, with our factories, all, et cetera, et cetera. These are the reality. This is the reality. This is what's happening. There's no reason that the world should not be running, you know, on clean free, if, if you're asking me, energy. It's just, it doesn't make sense as to why we can't, we can't do that. We can, we can have a mini computer, you know, in our hand, but we can't clean our planet. It's mind boggling to me. And um, Maurice Newman, the recent chief business advisor to the Australian prime minister, he says this to one of um, many areas being used to create the new world order. He thinks that climate change is involved with this new world order. If you're not familiar with the new world order, it's an order that takes away countless rights away from human beings. And it allows the state to militarize the police and put more restrictions on human freedom and thought. His claims have been backed up by many scientists in the field. So many people, um, climate scientists, who are attempting to tell us the truth, who are attempting to come to us and give us the reality, they're backing this. They're saying, they, they, they agree with Maurice Newman that it's possible that it, the reason why nobody, the reason why the government doesn't want to back this is because it's completely against what it is that they're trying to put in place. <clears throat> and when I hear stuff like that, when I read stuff like this, when I'm, you know, when I'm introduced to this, it just makes me think, who are these scientists? You know, who are they and who do they truly work for? What is really going on here? Science today is being used to push the globalization agenda and it's not bettering our planet. That's the way that it, it looks. That's what we're seeing on a grand scale. You know, we're, I hear about a new extinct animal every other day. And that's what that's what we have to gather, that our planet is not getting better. Um, it's, it's getting worse and it's being used to make the 1% even wealthier and to, you know, deceive the public, to deceive the rest of us into thinking that climate change doesn't exist or vaccines, everyone that they give you is good for you and whatever else, whatever it is that you may have heard. Um, it's just, it's just troubling. It's very, very troubling. If we want to change our world, I believe we can't look to the 1%. We just can't. They, um, our history, our experience shows that they just don't do anything for us and they don't, they're not here to help us, <laughs> not our, not the, the general public, not the rest of us. And, you know, we can't look to them to make decisions. We can't look to them to speak for us. We can't look to them, you know, for political agreements that serve only their own interests. They only do what it is that they want to do. 
And if we care about our planet, then it's up to us to do something about it. Their intention is not to heal the world, but to dominate it is what I what we see countlessly. And just a few more facts that I wanted to mention about climate change, like I said in the beginning, that climate has been changing since the world as we know it has began. Look that up further for yourself. We, you know, you've heard about the Ice Age. You've heard about many different stuff like that. And maybe you just haven't thought about literally what that means, that yes, our world was colder and now it is warmer. So we already know that our climate has been changing. This earth has been changing. This is not some crazy agenda. This is not, you know, some crazy phrase to get you scared. It's a reality. And I think that it should get you motivated to do something about it. And climate will continue to change, whether CO2 levels increase or not. So that's another thing as well. I mean, there we, I was re researching a little further CO2 about how it actually, it's amazing for plant growth, CO2, and we think that it harms us and all these different things. And I want to look further into that as well. And I want you to look further into it, please. Climate change. I mean, we definitely do know that there's always something bigger than what it is that we possibly perceive. But are we doing the best? Are we doing all that it is that we can do right now for our planet? All righty, we're gonna move on to our final topic today. Under true success, I just wanted to get very, very, very motivational today and very inspirational. We're gonna be talking about failing forward and how many, many, many people have found success through failure. And I wanna just say behind every success is an embarrassing first effort. It's a stumble, a setback, or a radical change of direction. Don't forget that. Just never, ever, ever let that statement um, leave your mind because it's so true. I'm going to say it again. Behind every success story is an embarrassing first effort, a stumble, a setback, or a radical change of direction. Don't forget that. I want to share with you guys today a few amazing success stories. Now, some of these I'm sure you may have heard of, and I'm actually many of these you probably have. And I know that sometimes it's hard to truly see, truly see through the negativity. I've been there myself. So hard that we often want to just give up. We're just done with, with the goal, with life sometimes. It can be brutal. I think though, by sharing this with you guys and just by just by reminding you, you know, that people had to really suffer to get to get the amazing accomplishments that the accomplishments that they have today. And you know that they did it, you know, there are other individuals who had to face those troubles and they did not give up. So I want to remind you guys to just not give up on yourselves and just to keep continuing. So we're gonna go over these five pretty cool people that just never, never quit. We're gonna start over with uh with JK Rowling. Many of you probably know her as the author of the Harry Potter novels, love the movies, right? But she was actually a waitress and she was on public assistance when she wrote that first Harry Potter novel. Mm -hmm. Take a moment. <laughs> Take a moment to really think about that. She was busting her butt. She really was. I can't even imagine waiting tables and then having to come home and literally create this entire universe on your own Writing, 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 writing. And it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. It's actually, um, she was actually rejected by dozens of publishers. It was even harder to get the book out. And rumor has it, the only reason that it got published is because the CEO's eight-year-old daughter begged him to publish it because she was just, I guess, so excited about the story and she liked it and she really wanted to read it. So that's how that happened. And that's just so amazing. These things like, there are stories like this every single day. So if you're right now working a nine to five job or a graveyard shift or just working crazy, ridiculous hours and you're like, how am I going to get my goals accomplished? How am I going to start my own business? How am I going to do that? Just remember there are other people that had to do it too. Remember that there are people that pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and that it's not an excuse, you know? You got to keep going. You got to keep pushing. And don't take no as an answer. She was rejected by dozens of publishers, dozens. That is amazing. She um, said, failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I love that quote. She's just like, listen, every little thing that went wrong was exactly what went right for my goal. I, I'll take that, J.K. Rowling. Number two is um, Michael Jordan. Of course, 
We now refer to Michael Jordan as one of the best basketball players of all time. And I really wouldn't be the one to disagree, but um, you're maybe not aware that he didn't even make his high, high school basketball team. Yeah, he just was he just didn't make it. They didn't want him. <clears throat> he actually said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeeded. Love that. So amazing. Just so inspirational, truly. He was rumored to have practiced as hard as he plays. And honestly, I mean, just considering his accomplishments, I would think so. Number three is Thomas Edison. Um, Thomas Edison was actually born both hearing impaired and fidgety. Did you know that? He was uh, quite a mess as a child. He only lasted three months in school. Um, his teacher actually told his mother that he is too stupid to learn anything. He eventually was just homeschooled by his mother and she was amazing as uh, from what I've heard, of course. And then when he was talking about his invention of the light bulb, he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that did not work. It's amazing. Here's a man who has literally, literally never taken no or failure or anything negative as an answer. So much we can learn from that kind of mindset. Definitely. Number four is Oprah Winfrey. Her childhood was was very frightful. It was filled with horror, abuse, um, abject poverty. But like most successful people, Oprah doesn't dwell on that stuff at all. She doesn't even see that as her past. She said, I don't think of myself as a poor, derived, or deprived, I'm sorry, ghetto girl who made good. I think of myself as somebody who, from an early age, knew I was responsible for myself and I had to make good. Love that. She really, really is an inspiration for so many young women, not just black women like myself, but so many women who just, like like Thomas Edison, did not take no for an answer. I love it. I love it. It reminds me to keep going and keep pushing. And finally is number five, Vincent Van Gogh. The man was a maniac depressive. He really, really was. He was quite insane, they say. He could barely function half the time. He never saw success in his actual lifetime. But his work is often regarded as the greatest paintings ever done by any human on earth. And he never even knew that. I'm not even sure if he thought that, you know? Because of this, his name has become a war cry for artists around the world who have been repeatedly rejected and sidelined. He's literally, Vincent van Gogh, it's amazing because it's true he has no idea like, the kind of inspiration that he's become to people of our lifetime. People are like, listen, you can be so amazing. Like Frida, right? Like Frida, I think of Frida as well. You can be so amazing and not even know it. Be so humble about it. Just be, just be yourself about it. And I think that's really, really cool because that teaches us even a bigger lesson is that you can succeed without even trying. But we really want to focus on the fact that people do, do try, we do fail, and we have to keep going. We have to just pick up. He said something that even the knowledge of my own failability cannot keep me from making mistakes. Only when I fall do I get up again. Vincent Van Gogh, even though he had a lot of unfortunate things going for him, he was very brilliant. He was very, very, very brilliant to say something like that. That he understands that every time he, ha he has to fall to get up again. He has to, he has to fail to know what it is that he can do right. And I just think that's a great way to think. So that that's our um, our true success topic today. I just want to leave you guys with some really, really inspirational people. Keep on pushing, just keep on working. Never give up and come back, come back to believe and keep on checking out these stories. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great one.